Well, hello there and welcome to another edition of Warbird Wednesday. My name is Fred Bell. I am the vice chairman of the Palm Springs Air Museum. And today we are covering the F-35, the Lockheed Martin F-35. Standing in front of the original Lightning, this is the Lightning II. We're going to talk about this latest generation of aircraft. But first, Greg has outfitted me. You know, YouTube doesn't allow me to ask a lot of questions on this in a pointed manner. I thought I would leave it at that. But my varlet assistant has uh, equipped me with a quite interesting hat today with some interesting, what would you call this, animation, Greg? I think this is animation. I, this is one of the, I, you know, I keep saying most ridiculous hats I've ever seen. I, he keeps getting farther out there. That one is way out there. Of course, it is gone. It is out of here. The deal is he gets the hats, and he is really pushing that deal. Oh, you cannot see it, but Greg is now wearing that. I, now I really see what that thing looks like. Oh, my goodness. So the F-35, I'm going to go ahead and throw up a plan view here. This is the apex of American advanced fighter design right now. Uh, Lockheed Martin, of course, won a competition against Boeing. Uh, Boeing had the X-32. Lockheed uh, had the X-35, eventually Lockheed Martin. And uh, they eventually won the competition. Now, we've been going down kind of stealth lane, right? So we're continuing in that vein. Now, remember, we talked about the F-22. F-22 was super maneuverable airplane, uh, had super cruise. It could cruise in supersonic speed, had all kind was super stealthy, just a lot of supers in there, Greg. But uh, the problem with it was it was incredibly expensive. It was way too expensive. So the Joint Strike Fighter program kind of all amalgamated into a push on the design concept on this airplane in the early 90s. And then it kind of progressed from there. And the idea was they rolled everything together. The F-22 is already going down the pipe, but got too bloated with cost. And then with the fall of the Soviet Union, there was not as much of a push of an air superiority fighter. They just were saying, why are we spending money on this? And there was a big push across all the services to eliminate a whole bunch of different programs. Seawolf, which was a sub, anything that was Cold War, that remember the design philosophy at that time was the Soviets are gonna build a bunch of everything. So we have to have aircraft, subs, ships, everything uh, that can destroy multiple, multiple airplanes and ships and everything else because we're gonna be hopelessly outnumbered. So that was kind of the thought process that went into everything in the mid, that came out of the 80s and went into the mid 90s. All of that went in the scrap heap with the thing that you call the peace dividend, which never really paid out because what ended up happening is we got sucked into all these brush fire wars in Afghanistan and the Gulf War and, and, and in Iraq and it chewed up most of our conventional forces. The one thing that they didn't have was uh, they had no uh, air superiority airplane. So in other words, we weren't fighting against people who had either uh, air missiles on the ground or anything that could really threaten aircraft. Maybe some man pads, some handheld launch missiles, but nothing. So there was a lot of economy going on at that time in getting rid of really expensive programs. That is pretty much what killed the F-22 in favor of the consolidation and then I've called this aircraft before, and I don't want to upset anybody who's in the F-35 program, but this is a Swiss Army knife aircraft. It can do all kinds of things. It has internal weapon space. It can carry up to about 2,500 pounds. It can fly for all the services. It can take off vertically.
with a Swiss Army knife airplane, there are all kinds of compromises that have to go on, right? One of which was they went away from, we have always had in American fighter design, recent fighter design, a twin engine airplane for a redundancy that the airplane is survivable. The engine became a single engine airplane. That was one of the first steps. The movement to, you can tell on the tail and everything we're starting and the inlets, we're incorporating stealth. We've gone from F-117 to F-22. We're incorporating some stealth features. We went from the F-22, which was had the radar signature of a marble, metal marble, to this aircraft, which now has the radar signature of, Greg, Greg, a metal golf ball. So we've gone a little bit bigger, but we're making compromises. We're still in storing inter weapons internally, although the aircraft does have external uh, storage on it. You can put external racks on it, but the minute you do that, all that money you spent on stealth goes right out the window. So the, the other thing on the aircraft, besides incorporating all this stuff, was good visibility. You still have that guy, a girl, up higher. This aircraft still has a gun. But uh, what else has happened, Greg? In the 90s, there was a revolution, and that revolution was in data management and data storage. The, uh, the clock speed, the speed at which these processors ran just went through the roof. Data storage got smaller. It shrunk down. Tiny little data storage. And so what ended up happening was you started really having the ability of all the avionics. People were talking about integrating weapon systems for years, but you ended up in this airplane with the ability to have the airplane um, suddenly, I talked about, and I used it last week, the unblinking eye, having all of these sensors now incorporated into the helmet. The helmet that the pilot wears in this aircraft is ridiculously complicated, but it gives him all kinds of heads up or her heads up information. So the pilot has all kinds of data and the sensors on the aircraft, because they're smart weapons, they can be incorporated into smart weapon technology, you know, one missile, uh, one target type of stuff or precision drops. We've gone away from what would be like the P-38, the original P-38, or a lot of American fighter design that came out of Boyd with the fighter mafia, where we have aircraft that are really good fighter interceptors, and they're night fighters. Their job is, the F-22's job is to go out and get air superiority and take on enemy aircraft. This thing is designed, the F-35 is to be a reasonably good uh, fighter, but also to do a lot of other missions. And the idea is that it's not gonna beat you by necessarily, it can do, it's, it's fairly maneuverable, but it's not gonna beat you by doing the things like the F-22 could do, right? Which is thrust vectoring technology and all this other stuff that it can just basically fly your wings off. Its deal here is it has the ability to beat you through data management and over the horizon, shooting it at you from over the horizon or getting you before you ever get in close to the airplane. That is really the idea of the technology. Now that, comes at a price, Greg. Do you know what that price is? It's kind of like me. It chunked up. It got heavier when it, from the design. It got a lot more chunky, you know, and so the airplane got a lot more expensive. It got heavier, and that created a bunch of problems for the airplane in its design. It was no longer as cheap as what people had thought it would be, and its operational costs, uh, an F-15C, costs about $41,000 a flight hour to operate. Now think about that for a second, compared to some of the airplanes we operate in the museum, which are a couple hundred dollars or $500, which is amazing. The F-35 is $44,000 a flight hour. Now the manufacturer, Lockheed Martin, has committed over the uh, next period of time to bring it down by 25,000. I do not see that happening. I just, you know, that 
I think it's unreasonably. It, first of all, if the airplane pro provides the value that it should, the, that differential in cost per flight hour isn't that much between an F F um, 15C, but you get a lot more bang for your buck with this airplane, uh, so to speak. So I don't think that that's a, a big trade-off, but I think part of the situation that has plagued this airplane is that um, there were unrealistic expectations on the development of the technology when it started, and it's just given it trouble all the way down the line. So today, what I'm gonna do is work into my salute, and that is all of the intrepid, and I say this, boys and girls that have worked on this airplane. The, this aircraft uh, is actually uh, in production now. There are 709 of them have been built. Um, there are plans, the U.S. plans to go big on this airplane and buy 24, 2,500 of them. That's a lot of airplanes. And that's a deployment, by the way, on the scale of like the F-15. It, it's a big, heavy deployment of, of these aircraft, and that's in all the variants. But what I wanna to do today is go all the way back to the beginning of Joint Strike Fighter and the DARPA folks and all those folks, and this airplane is a game changer, let's be fair. And to the folks that have worked on it and have been, I think, unfairly maligned at times, and the air crews that are now proving that it actually, the technology works, I wanna salute you. Today, what I'm gonna salute you with is Jones Cane Sugar Soda. We've heard of Jones before. This is a pineapple cream soda. Not really excited about that, Greg. Uh, uh, independent since 1996. Mm, they got the pure cane sugar memo. So we, we know that. And there is a California cash refund, which means this thing's not 9,000 years old, like the soda you gave me last week that, thank God I didn't, uh, have a, um, a botulism attack of that. But uh, we're gonna go ahead, and this is a screw top, which is even nicer. And we're gonna give it a shot. Jones Pineapple Cream Soda. You know, Jones has never been a hit with me. <laughs> Greg is smiling. Yeah, you got me. Um, you know, it, it's cold, but it's not necessarily uh, what I would say is a uh, something I would drink. Hmm. Obligatory second sip, which we do with the Kenny, but I think that's going to be it for me. That's not like last week where I would even drink that one flat because it's actually pretty good, but that's just not, oh, the finish on that is, it's like, eating a, uh, you know those peeps? It's like eating a 10-year-old peep, the finish on it. That's what it tastes like to me. So really uh, uh, interesting design. Like I said, it still incorporates stealth, has the signature of a metal golf ball. Relatively fast at Mach 1.6, but let's put it in context of an F-22 or the aircraft that we've covered that are about 1,400 miles an hour. Now we're down at about 1,000, a little over 1,000 miles an hour. So we've slowed the airplane down, gone to that single engine. It can do vertical takeoff. It has internal weapon storage space, but it can be uh, bombed up or loaded up with external stores. So it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it is an airplane that is, needs to be where it's at right now because what is happening right now, Greg? and Top Gun 2 opened and we saw, now the, inter the most interesting thing, if you haven't seen that film, I encourage you to go see it because the Navy actually acknowledges the F-18 Hornet, which is a fourth generation fighter, is pretty much outnumbered against or outgunned, outflown by a fifth generation fighter of an unnamed entity. We won't say who they are. They look an awfully lot like Russian airplanes, but they aren't Russian airplanes. We're not going to call them out. But the, um, and, and what the thrust vectoring technology and how maneuverable those airplanes are against a fourth generation fighter in air combat. What's even more amazing is uh, some other flight sequences in the movie, which I'm not going to give the spoilers away on that. 
but you need to see that the, the that movie is amazing but but the there is a very good contrast between a fourth generation aircraft and a fifth generation generation airplane and what they can do and the comparable aircraft in this uh I'm going to give Greg a workout it's the J20 the FC31 the SU57 and the SU75 now somebody at home is going to go well you didn't mention I those are the only aircraft that the research I'm doing right now have ever real any hope of ever getting to production fifth generation fighters but there are going to be fifth generation adversary aircraft out there and we're going to have to have aircraft like this that can go up against them and and take them on there is uh the hornets and anything out there uh is is getting pretty long in the tooth and we just have to accept that that those airplanes time have come now this aircraft has seen combat it did some groundwork in 2018 for the united states marine corps so semper fi u.s marines you were the first aircraft or the first service to christen this airplane in combat uh and we will just have to see where this one ends up greg i i think uh, the airplane is scheduled to be upgraded. In other words, this is one of those airplanes that Lockheed says that the part that has to be replaced is one panel away. So in other words, you don't have to go digging. And, and so this is a component airplane. So we'll see if that plays out. The airplane is scheduled to be able to be upgraded out to 2044. So quite a long time that they can continue to, to upgrade the airframe and, and keep the airframe fresh, I would say. So we'll see what happens with the F-35 as we go forward. I'm gonna go ahead and put this one back on the stick, so to speak. Now, if you wanna own your F-35, we can make that happen right now, right now. We can have you go out to the website, click on that link, and you can order your very own F-35 Lightning II shirt. Jason will send it to you quickly, easily, and uh, even my Varlet assistant. I'm gonna use that twice because that soda was so bad that you can, uh, you, you can, he'll put the link up in the description and, and you can go out and order the shirt. Now, I say it all the time, but we cannot do what we do without your donation. So if you run across us, on one of the platforms we're on there's a link on there to make a donation donate a few bucks we could certainly use it we need those donations uh, if you come across us on youtube uh, we would love your subscription we all we do are long form aircraft videos either aircraft in our collection or in this case what we're doing is finishing up from our f-117 and the follow-on aircraft so the next thing is i've got a few ideas greg as to where we're going to go with this from here but uh, we are gonna keep going, so uh, keep checking on us. But if you like long form, we only do military airplanes, give us a subscription and a like. If you come across us on Facebook, give us a like and uh, give us comments. We love your comments. If you have some ideas on some um, aircraft that we should cover, we'd love to do it. Put it in the comment section, you never know. We might choose that. My name is Fred Bell. I am the vice chairman of the Palm Springs Air Museum. Thanks for joining us. Have a great day.